Okay, this talk is about high dimensional expanders, so I need to start out by telling you what are expander graphs. So, uh, an expander graph is informally a deregular graph where the random walk on the vertices of the graph mixes quickly. So more formally, we can make the following definition. We'll say a deregular graph is a beta expander. Um, if the random walk matrix for the graph, which is just uh, 1 over d times the adjacency matrix, has second largest eigenvalue, lambda 2, at most beta, and this beta should be smaller than 1, and 1 is always the largest uh, eigenvalue of the random walk matrix. Now, generally, we don't just want a single uh, graph, deregular graph, with small second eigenvalue. Generally, we want a deregular beta expander family, meaning a sequence of ever larger and larger finite graphs, g sub n, where the regularity parameter d is fixed and the second largest eigenvalue bound beta is also fixed. And expander graph families have many, many uses in theoretical computer science, especially if they're explicit families and or if they have extra symmetry properties. I should also mention that uh, if you're not worried about explicitness, they're quite easy to get. If you just choose a random deregular graph then on n vertices, then it'll be a really excellent expander. In particular, the beta parameter will be something like 1 over square root d. Okay, so that's expander graphs. Now, in order to talk about high dimensional expander graphs, we need to talk briefly about a pretty simple concept in graph theory, the link of a vertex of a graph. So here's an example graph. Uh, so here's an example vertex too, the screen vertex, and what is the link of this vertex? Well, the way I like to think about it is you imagine taking this vertex and sort of picking it up off into the sky a little bit and remembering which vertices it's connected to. So it's connected to these six uh, pink vertices. And then the link of the green vertex is just the graph induced on these neighboring pink vertices, which in this case happens to be a cycle of length six. So just to make sure that uh, this example is clear, let's look at the link of some other vertices. So let's look at this aqua vertex down here. Again, you should imagine sort of lifting up into the sky and seeing who it's connected to. It's connected to these three pink vertices. And these three pink vertices are not actually forming a connected graph, but that's perfectly fine. The link of a vertex does not have to be a connected graph. So here, in this case, the link uh, is a three to vertex graph with just one edge. So it's this disconnected graph over here. And let's do one more example. I'll let you think about it for a moment. Let's look at this purple vertex here. What is the link of this purple vertex? Well, if you think about it, it's uh, this graph here. It's connected to four vertices, and it has two edges. Okay, so that's the concept of the link of a vertex in a graph. And now I'm able to tell you what are high dimensional expanders. So uh, at high level, high dimensional expanders are a generalization of expander graphs to simplicial complexes. And they are having emerging applications in computer science theory, especially in coding theory and property testing. Uh, for 95% of this talk, I'm only going to talk about the first level generalization of expander graphs, which is two-dimensional expanders. So uh, plain expander graphs are one-dimensional expanders, and I'll mostly just tell you what about uh, two-dimensional expanders. Okay, so there are a few definitions, but I think this is more or less standard. Uh, deregular graph, G, is said to be a two-dimensional expander, or with more adjectives, a local two-dimensional expander, if it has two properties. So property one is that for every vertex V in the graph, the link graph, which we just talked about, should be a beta expander. So the link graph should be a good expander. And moreover, uh, the whole graph G itself should also be a good expander with some other parameter beta prime. Now, uh, this looks like, you know, it's got a lot of conditions to check. There's two conditions, but actually, there's a theorem, uh, sometimes called trickling down. It's a very simple theorem. I think, in some sense, first proved by Zhuk in the early 2000s. And it says the following. Whenever you have property one holding, so the link of every vertex is a beta expander with beta some number, then you sort of automatically get property two. You automatically get that beta prime is at most beta over one minus beta. This is assuming that the overall graph G is connected, but I'm gonna henceforth assume that our big graphs G are always connected and won't mention it anymore. 
So in particular, you see, as long as beta is less than a half, this is a critical condition, beta less than a half, then this fraction, beta over one minus beta, will be strictly less than one, and so that means that beta prime will be smaller than one, and that's good. And so in some sense, you can kind of, in your head, drop condition two, as long as you uh, ensure that the beta parameter here is less than a half for your links. And moreover, you can also note that, you know, if you manage to get a really good beta for all of your links, then the corresponding beta prime is also roughly beta if, if beta is small. Okay, so therefore we can kind of think of this as our definition of a, a two-dimensional expander. It's just a connected graph where every vertex has a link graph, which is a good expander. Its beta parameter should be at most a half. Uh, one thing that this implies, and this is also not hard to prove, is that the graph has the property that if you do the natural random walk on the triangles of the graph, then this also mixes quickly. So what do I mean by that? Well, you just take your graph, and it has a bunch of triangles in it, and you start at any triangle, maybe this one, and you walk to an adjacent triangle, that is one sharing an edge, and from that you walk to another adjacent triangle, and another adjacent triangle, and so forth. So if you have this uh, two-dimensional expander condition, then one consequence is that this uh, random walk on triangle mixes quickly. And since we also know that this implies that the global graph is a good expander, it also means the random walk on vertices mixes quickly. Uh, on the other hand, I should mention that this implication is only one direction. So mixing quickly uh, on the random triangle walk does not necessarily imply this uh, two-dimensional expander property. This is a stronger property. Okay, so now here's an even stronger condition, which is not necessary for a high-dimensional expander, but one way you could have a high-dimensional expander, a two-dimensional expander, is if, in fact, the link of every vertex was the same graph. If every vertex link was the same graph, and that graph itself was a beta expander with beta smaller than a half, then that would imply the condition to be a two-dimensional expander. So again, this is definitely stronger, but it's like a natural idea for trying to come up with a two-dimensional expander graph. So, in fact, this graph I've been showing on the, the slides here has this property. If you take a look at, let's say, this green vertex, what is its link? Well, it's connected to these five vertices, and they form a cycle. So the link of the green vertex here is a five cycle. Uh, but also the link of this green vertex is a five cycle. And the link of this green vertex, if you take a look, is also a five cycle. And in fact, in this graph, the link of every vertex is a five cycle. Uh, it's not so easy to actually see that from the picture of the graph, but you may also check that this is the graph of the icosahedron. Uh, and if you look at this picture of the icosahedron, it's much easier to see that for every vertex, if you look at the, the neighbors, they make a five cycle. Moreover, uh, oh, well, let me say that uh, in particular, we can introduce this definition uh, of being a graph of constant link L. So this graph here, G, is a graph of constant link L where L is the five cycle. And this is what's going on in this condition. So uh, it's not hard to show that the second largest eigenvalue of the five cycle is cosine two pi over five. And that's about 0 0.309, and that's smaller than one half. So this is great, we did it. We've solved the problem, we've got this big graph here is a two dimensional expander. Uh, because all its links are the five cycle graph, and this five cycle graph has second largest second value smaller than a half. So that's nice, but of course, like with expander graphs, we're not really interested in just finding like one specific graph that's a two dimensional expander. We really want like a family of such graphs, uh, of sort of ever larger finite graphs on larger and larger number of vertices, where every graph is uh, a two-dimensional expander with the same value of beta and maybe the same uh, d regularity. Okay, so you might say to yourself, this shouldn't be too bad. Let's just get some uh, little graph L on some d vertices, some fixed graph, and make sure its second largest eigenvalue L is less than a half. And then as long as we can get arbitrarily large graphs g of constant link L, then we did it. We have a, a two-dimensional expander family. And, you know, you might think that, like, oh, finding graphs L that are good expanders could itself be hard, but not really, because D is really a constant, so, like, L need not be a sparse graph. It could have, I don't know, degrees square root D. It could even, you know, be a graph on four vertices or something, as long as its lambda 2 is smaller than a half, and you can make arbitrarily large G of constant link L, then you got your two-dimensional expander family. So one might ask, how hard could this really be? Well, let's talk about this concept, graphs of constant link L. 
These are also sometimes known as locally L graphs, but uh, for this presentation, I'll just use this phrase, graph of constant link L. So let's try with uh, four vertices. Let's just, I don't know, pick a four, four vertex graph L. So here's a popular four vertex graph, the four cycle. And this particular L has second largest eigenvalue zero, which is certainly smaller than half, so that's good. So let's just try to make uh, a graph G of constant link L. So the natural first idea is, okay, take this four cycle and plunk down a new vertex, this green vertex, and connect it up to all these pink vertices. And now this green vertex is happy. Its link is this four cycle. Okay. Now, uh, let's see, if you're gonna have a graph of constant link equal to the four cycle, then every vertex needs to have degree four. So if we take a peek at this green vertex, it currently has degree three, so we're gonna need a new vertex if its link is gonna be the four cycle. These are who it's currently connected to, so it's natural to just add in some new vertex, connect it up with the green vertex and also with these pink vertices to make sure that now this green vertex has link, which is the four cycle. And great, now it's satisfied. And let's continue taking a peek at this graph. Actually, you see this, this green vertex here already has degree four. So we better make sure it's got link equal to the four cycle. And if you look at its link currently, it's actually this path of length three. So we should kind of add this edge in between these two corner vertices to make sure we get uh, the green vertex having a link equal to the four cycle. And okay, we can do that. But now if you take a peek at this graph, every vertex has degree four. So we can't really add anything without making this graph disconnected. We should also double check that all the other vertices we didn't look at have link the four cycle. They happen to, uh, which is good, but what we've sort of shown here is that there is just one unique graph, G, whose constant link is the four cycle, and it's this graph which is a slightly wonky diagram, actually, of the octahedron graph, where, again, it's sort of easy to perceive that every vertex has a link, which is a four cycle. So, okay, uh, that seemed like a good idea, but we didn't get, you know, a family of high-dimensional expander graphs. We just got a single one. So, okay, let's try a different L. Here's another popular four-vertex graph, the complete graph on four vertices. And it's not hard to show that its lambda two is negative a quarter, which is even more better. It's even smaller than a half. So that's great. So, okay, let's just try to make, uh, you know, large graphs whose constant link is the complete graph on four vertices. So we'll do the same thing. We'll add in a green vertex and connect it to all the vertices in our uh, complete graph of four vertices. And now this green vertex has the correct link. Uh, but then, actually, we're stuck because, again, um, if you're going to be a graph with constant link, this complete graph on four vertices, then every vertex should have degree four. And if you look at this graph we've built, every vertex already has degree four. So we kind of did it, but again, we've got this theorem that there's just a unique graph of constant link K4, the complete graph on four vertices, namely K5, the complete graph on five vertices. So once again, things didn't quite work out for us, and now we might be feeling a little bit annoyed. Um, we might say, you know what? Let's try this graph on four vertices, the empty graph on four vertices, four vertices with no edges. Now, this is not gonna be good for us because its second eigenvalue is one, which is not smaller than a half, but we might feel frustrated that we haven't got you know, big graphs of constant link L, so let's try it with this L. So okay, we'll do the same thing. We'll add in a new green vertex, connect it to the four vertices, and great, now this green vertex has constant link, the empty graph on four vertices. And now we'll maybe take this green vertex and add some vertices to its neighborhood to make it have constant link equal to the four vertex empty graph. And maybe we'll do it again with this vertex, add in three more vertices to make it have constant link, our L and so forth and so on. And actually in here you see you can keep going as long as you want. You could make an infinite graph if you wanted, but you know, as long as you eventually wrap things back on themselves and you get any four regular graph at all uh, without triangles, then it has a desired property. So any four regular graph, any number of vertices, as long as you don't have triangles, then it's a graph of constant link equal to this empty graph on four vertices. Which is nice, so I don't know, this 
literally random graph that I picked has this property. It's a nice graph with constant link equal to this L. And in fact, a random n vertex graph that's uh, for regular, a random for regular graph has a good chance of having no triangles, which is nice, and it will be a good expander with high probability, and that's all well and good. Um, but as I mentioned, this particular L is not good for us because it's lambda two is one. Hmm. So you could try a few more examples yourself and see that things are not actually ever really working with L, uh, a four vertex graph. So you might say, let's try a five vertex graph. How about this five cycle that we studied before? Well, uh, we saw a graph whose constant link was this five cycle, but again, it's not hard to show the theorem that there is a unique graph of constant length of five cycle, namely this icosahedron graph. So again, we're foiled in our attempt to get arbitrarily large uh, graphs. Okay, well, what about the six cycle? Here's the six cycle, uh, L. And hey, guess what? Presto, we're in good shape. There are arbitrarily large finite graphs with constant link equal to the six cycle. Hooray. Except that the second largest eigenvalue of the six cycle is cosine two pi over six, which is exactly one half. It just fails to be smaller than a half. And so it's also not good for us for constructing high dimensional expanders, two dimensional expanders. Uh, in fact, it can be shown that any graph, uh, any finite graph whose constant link is the six cycle is a triangulation of the torus or the Klein bottle. So you see it's a little bit funny. Some Even some topology is starting to enter in the picture here. So here is a picture um, of a finite graph. I mean, it's sort of drawn embedded on a torus where every vertex has a link, which is a six cycle. And uh, actually, unfortunately, you can, you can see that this is not a coincidence because this graph is not a good expander in general. It takes a really long time to walk from one vertex to a distant vertex on the surface of the torus. Right, so this task that seemed so easy at the beginning to construct a two-dimensional expander family is looking a bit annoying. You might say, okay, uh, okay, maybe we'll just fix some small good expander graph L, like the Peterson graph. That's everybody's favorite graph, right? It's this 10 vertex graph, it's degree three, its second largest eigenvalue is one third, which is smaller than a half. Great. Well, not so great. There's a theorem by Hall from 1980 that shows there are exactly three graphs with constant length, the Peterson graph. So again, we don't get arbitrarily large finite graphs. Okay, uh, what's another small good expander? How about the Paley graph? This is actually a family of graphs parameterized by some Q, and it even has like a little bit of an algebraic definition. So again, you see algebra kind of creeping into the story now, but it's like a popular small uh, graph with great expansion. The Q vertex Paley graph has second largest eigenvalue equal to this, which is basically like one over root Q. So how about that? Well, no, there's a theorem from 2005, Muzichuk and Kovac. Uh, for any Q other than nine, there's just one graph with constant link equal to the Paley graph. A on Q vertices, and don't get your hopes up with Q equals nine. Uh, for Q equals nine, there are just two graphs with constant link, the Paley nine graph. So yeah, just to further convince you that this whole task grasps the constant link, which seems simple, is not so simple. Um, Bulitko in 1972 showed that given a graph L, it's actually undecidable whether there's an infinite graph G of constant link L. And actually, finding an infinite graph of constant link L is even kind of easier than finding arbitrarily large finite graphs with constant link L. If there are arbitrarily large finite graphs with constant link L, it's not hard to show there's also an infinite graph G. So you're not even done if you just find an infinite graph G, but it's a prerequisite, and this is already undecidable. Uh, I should say, though, that actually it's also known once L has girth at least six, then you can always find infinite graphs G. Let's say if L is regular, but that still doesn't help with finding f finitely or, or infinitely many um, finite graphs. Here's another fact that might make you think this topic is not as simple as it might have seemed. Uh, graphs of constant link play a role in the famous classification of finite simple groups. And just one more thing that touches on group theory, I found this uh, PhD thesis of Harm Gramlich from 2002 called On Graphs, Geometries, and Groups of Lie Type, and it contains many theorems of the form in it 
uh, there are only finitely many graphs having constant link, you know, this and such L. So yeah, this seems harder than it looks, and it seems that we're going to need a hero, and maybe use some group theory as well. Right, so this is our first hero, uh, Professor Christina Ballantin. And relatedly, we have this second hero, which is this graph here, which I will call L3. I'll explain what L3 is in just a moment. Uh, but this particular graph, one can show, not hard, that its second largest eigenvalue is root three over four, which is indeed smaller than a half. And guess what? Hey, presto, we have this theorem from 2000 uh, by Ballantin that there are arbitrarily large finite graphs G of constant link L3. So we did it. Well, she did it. Uh, and from this, one can get 26 regular, local, two-dimensional expander families. And one question that a theoretical computer scientist will immediately ask here is, are these explicit families, or does she merely show that they exist? And uh, the answer to this question is, actually, honestly, I'm not sure. Uh, her paper uses some extremely sophisticated math, you know, Langlands conjectures and Selberg theorems and so forth and so on. Uh, and so I couldn't even tell. Uh, I actually emailed her and asked her, and she sent back a very helpful response. And she said that um, they're not, you know, quote unquote, very explicit. Now, actually, if I had to guess, I would kind of maybe imagine that formally they are explicit in the TCS formal definition sense, but maybe, you know, Colloquially, they're not so explicit in the sense that maybe her paper doesn't just kind of give you uh, a simple way to describe her graphs G. This is going to be a moot point because uh, shortly we'll see that there are completely explicit graphs G like this. Uh, okay, so actually, more generally, uh, she showed that there's an analogous graph, which I'll again describe in a moment, called LP for P any odd prime. And for these graphs, you get uh, deregular local two-dimensional expander families, high-dimensional expander families. And moreover, they have sort of the uh, best possible expansion, order one over root d. So these are not just uh, you know, good two-dimensional expanders, but they're you know, very, very good two-dimensional expanders. Um, in fact, Ramanujan, as we'll say, C. So, okay, let's explain what this LP graph is. Uh, here it is depicted in the case P equals three. I should actually also mention that there's a, the L2 graph makes sense. It's a 14 vertex graph that you can also use, but in Ballantine's paper, she you know, assumes P is an odd prime, so we'll stick with P equals three for this discussion. Uh, it doesn't necessarily look like it, but this is a bipartite graph. It can also be drawn like this. And what is this bipartite graph? Well, uh, the vertices can be just associated with all the lines in the three-dimensional vector space uh, over the field FP. And you can associate the vertices on the other side with all the two-dimensional planes in the three-dimensional vector space over field FP. And you put in an edge if you know, the line is contained in the 2D plane. So that's a very nice graph. It's actually very easy to show that it's a good expander. You could just square the adjacency matrix and it becomes almost a trivial uh, adjacency matrix. And yeah, you can also see that, you know, okay, some algebra, some, some uh, you know, linear algebra, some group theory is entering into the definition and maybe this will indeed help one reason, as she did, that there are arbitrarily large finite graphs um, that have this particular LP as a constant link. Great, so now let's do a little bit of history. I'll tell you about some more heroes in this area. I should also mention straight off that I'm not like an expert on the history of this subject, and I gleaned all this information I'm about to tell you by just reading papers. So if you know more correct information, feel free to leave it in the comments. So there's a very, very enjoyable paper by Cartwright, Soleil, and Juk from 2002, which is based on these earlier papers. I'm not gonna read everything on this uh, slide carefully, but, um, they give you an extremely explicit definition, first, of an infinite graph called G infinity, which is a tripartite graph on three vertex sets, V0, V1, and V2. And each of these V0, V1, V2 is basically a copy of um, this set, all the three by three matrices, where the entries of the matrices are polynomials over an indeterminate X uh, with coefficients mod three, and a few other minor conditions here. 
And this is all the vertices. And then they just tell you, how do you put a, the edges in this graph? You put an edge from a vertex M, which is a matrix, to you know, these 13 other vertices that you get by multiplying M by some combination of these two explicit matrices. So you can look at this formula if you like. And uh, it's not hard to show at all. It's extremely concrete that uh, this is G infinity is an infinite graph of constant link L3. Um, you know, you got a, uh, every link is this 26 vertex graph L3. And not only do you get this infinite graph, you can moreover get arbitrarily large finite graphs out of this just by taking your whole infinite graph and modding out all the entries of all the matrices by some irreducible polynomial. And that just gives you a finite graph that also has constant link L3. So uh, that's really great. Uh, this is, gives us more um, or generalized definitions of finite high-dimensional expander families, two-dimensional expander families. But moreover, there's generalizations both to the case not where the link is L3, but any LP, and also not just to two-dimensional expanders, but also to k-dimensional expanders, which I won't define what they are, but you know, they're a higher dimensional generalization of two-dimensional expanders. Moreover, in this 2002 paper, they made a nice conjecture. They conjectured that for any irreducible that you mod out by, thereby giving you like a finite graph, not only are these really good two-dimensional expanders or k-dimensional expanders, they're even, they conjectured, quote unquote, Ramanujan two-dimensional expanders or k-dimensional expanders. Uh, and what does Ramanujan mean? It means that the expansion constant uh, beta that you get actually for the global graph the global large finite graph is as small as it can be given that the graph has constant link LP. So in some sense, you know, these are optimally expanding uh, two-dimensional or k-dimensional expanders given that your constant link is this graph LP. And, you know, at the end of the paper, they basically said, you know, it, uh, if someone would just prove the Langlands correspondence for GLN over this uh, Laurent series field, FQ, blah, 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 that would help us prove our conjecture. That would be great. And then uh, in 2003, many things happened on the subject. First of all, Laforgue proved said Langlands correspondence which, you know, as I said, doesn't immediately prove their conjecture, but seemed like it would be very helpful for proving their conjecture. Uh, then, independently, several uh, people and groups of people constructed Ramanujan k-dimensional expanders, explicit ones. So Winnie Lee uh, kind of looked at the situation and said, you know, we don't, at the time, maybe when she was working, don't have this Langlands correspondence, but we know some variants of this Langlands correspondence which have proven have been proven to be true, and so by varying the construction, we can get explicit Ramanujan k-dimensional expanders for all k. Uh, Lubotsky, Samuels, and Vishne in 2003 um, used the Laforg result, and also assuming some other thing called global Lutrake Langlands correspondence for function fields and positive characteristic, which actually at the time experts hadn't quite proven, though they more or less knew should be true, they proved uh, the cartwright sole juk conjecture, uh, at least when k, the dimension of the k-dimensional expanders, is prime, and even when k is not prime, they showed that most irreducibles work, and therefore they also got, um, you know, explicit Ramanujan k-dimensional expanders based on this original uh, construction. And also at the same time, uh, Sarven Yazi, in his PhD thesis, kind of did, you know, some mix of these uh, Lee and Lubotsky Samuels Vishnia things. And then, actually, in 2014, this global Jacques line lens blah, blah, blah was proven, so everything is all good. Okay, now I'm going to tell you about some even more heroes on the subject of high-dimensional expanders. And uh, these new heroes are Tally Kaufman and Ishar Oppenheim. And they gave a new and different construction, which I like very much. And it has a bunch of properties, so let me read these properties out to you. So um, they gave strongly explicit family of uh, deregular k-dimensional expanders. Again, I'll focus on k equals two for the most part, but you know they got it for any k. And their expansion parameter uh, is like one over d to one tenth, I think. So okay, maybe it's not Ramanujan, but it is very, very good. Like it has a property that if you make d larger and larger, but constant, you can make this expansion parameter go to zero quite fast. Um, okay, in our case that we like, when k equals two, each of their finite graphs gn is a graph of constant link for a certain uh, other graph, l prime, which I'm not actually gonna define, but like it's a 
pretty simple graph L prime, and it's not hard to show that it's an expander. Uh, I also like the fact that their construction is pretty well motivated, at least for me. You know, they explain it in a way that makes you think like, oh, this is a sensible way to try to make graphs of constant link and thereby get high dimensional expanders. Also, moreover, the analysis in their paper is quite simple. It is, in fact, elementary. Uh, in particular, the presentation of it in this other paper by Harsha and Saptarishi is extremely simple and elementary. I highly, highly recommend reading this uh, paper by Harsha and Saptarishi about the Kaufman-Oppenheim paper. It's such a pleasurable paper to read. It explains things so nicely. I mean, Kaufman-Oppenheim is also well explained, but I just I really enjoyed reading this Harsha Saptarishi paper. Um, furthermore, you can uh, find some technical advantages that their construction has over the other constructions. In some sense, it's got more symmetries than the other constructions. So let's say in the k equals 2 case, the one we'd like to focus on, their construction of these graphs of constant link L prime, it's basically like a Cayley graph over a certain group, SL3 FQ, which is basically the 3 by 3 matrices with entries from the finite field FQ. But, um, not only is it vertex transitive, as Cayley graphs are, it's even um, top face, top dimensional face transitive, or in the k equals two case, triangle, triangle transitive. So there's like a self symmetry and automorphism of their graphs uh, that can take any triangle to any other triangle. And in particular, it can take any edge to any other edge, and it gives a, therefore an edge transitive expander graph, among other things. And edge transitive expander graphs are actually an important graph to have. They were used in this earlier kaufman lubotsky paper to positively resolve the existence of a fairly long-standing open problem in coding theory, the existence of um, highly symmetric, transitive, uh, good LDPC codes. So the previous construction that Kaufman and Lubotsky used was quite sophisticated using all this fancy technology. And uh, this construction is completely elementary and can be used instead if you like. Great. So finally, I'm able to tell you about this new work that I did with Kevin Pratt, uh, mostly Kevin Pratt's work. And uh, what we did is give us several even further constructions of high dimensional expanders, basically generalizing Kaufman-Oppenheim or following the Kaufman-Oppenheim mode. So let me read you out how our um, bullet points compare to theirs. So we get strongly explicit families of deregular uh, k-dimensional expanders, again, with expansion parameter that's like one over d to some constant, depending on exactly the um, construction that you use. Uh, so this is good. It's not you know, maybe Ramanujan, but it, you know, the expansion parameter is close to 0 when d is large. Uh, again, when k equals 2, this turned out to be you know, arbitrarily large finite graphs. Um, where the link of every vertex is not necessarily the same. It could be one of two graphs, either L prime from Kaufman-Oppenheim or some other graph, L double prime. Uh, again, I won't define them, but they're not too hard to define graphs. Uh, you know, since I said I find the Kaufman-Oppenheim construction motivated, I also find our construction pretty well motivated, albeit the definitions that you get into for our new constructions are a bit more involved. Um, you know, to show that these things are high dimensional expanders, or let's say two dimensional expanders, you need to show that these link graphs are themselves expanders. And that is not too hard. Uh, in the end, for us, it boils down to um, some Cayley graph stuff and uh, ultimately um, uh, the Schwartz zippel lemma. Uh, our constructions also have more and new symmetry properties. So, sort of like, uh, these more symmetries that Kaufman often have, but with different and new symmetry groups. Um, so, for example, a Kaufman Oppenheim construction is, you know, got this transitivity property for the triangles, let's say, or k dimensional faces, with respect to the symmetry group SLK um, FQ. So, basically, k by k matrices uh, from over the, finite, over the finite field FQ. And uh, this group here is basically the most canonical, one of the most canonical of all the simple groups. So uh, simple group is a group theory term. The simple groups are kind of like the prime numbers of groups. They're the basic building block groups from which all other groups can some, in some sense be built. And so Kaufman and Ivan's construction is sort of very symmetric with respect to this group. And what we did is get an analogously symmetric construction for many more of the simple groups. And here we're actually a little bit following um, 
sort of uh, some of the advances that happened in the last uh, decade or two with respect to just plain old expander graphs, where a lot of progress was made by trying to find expander graphs that were Cayley graphs for all the different simple groups. And by studying this, you know, um, new uh, constructions of expander graphs were given that had applications in uh, pseudorandomness and so forth. So we're kind of trying to do the same thing, but for high dimensional expanders. So before I tell you more about that, I actually want to tell you a little bit of what I know about what are the finite simple groups. And uh, there's, of course, a very famous theorem about them called the classification of finite simple groups, which literally tells you all the finite simple groups. And this famous theorem looks like this. It says every finite simple group is one of you know, a list. So what's on this list? Well, uh, kind of this, the simplest finite simple groups are these uh, integers modulo a prime zp uh, under addition. And these are abelian. And actually, it's kind of known that you're never going to build good expanders or high dimensional expanders out of abelian groups. So, this first bullet point in the list, uh, you know, we won't use to construct high dimensional expanders. Uh, the second bullet point on the list, uh, this is not normally the order you say them in, but uh, another kind of simple group is like one of the 26 sporadic groups. And these are literally just some 26 finite specific groups. And since they're just a finite size, they don't lead to arbitrarily large high dimensional expanders, so we sort of don't worry about them either. Okay. What are the other finite simple groups? Well, before I go on to the third bullet point, I have to tell you something like slightly annoying. It's like a minor boring detail. All the remaining simple groups um, have the property that they're like the little sibling of an older sibling group. And this older sibling group is like almost the same thing as the little sibling group, except it has like a much more famous name, uh, but it's not technically simple. So, you know, in theory, you're obliged to list the junior siblings that are actually the simple groups. But I'm going to like cheat a little bit and just name their older siblings, which are basically the same, uh, because they have slightly more well-known names. And our constructions actually work with either of the siblings, so never mind about that. So the next one on the list is the symmetric group, the family of the symmetric group on n symbols. You know, uh, group theory aficionados will know that actually the simple family is the alternating group, but it's very, very similar, similar to the similar simple group. Sorry, the symmetric group. And uh, we don't handle it. It's a very good open problem to construct very symmetric high dimensional expanders based on the symmetric group. That would be nice. OK, what's the fourth bullet point? The fourth bullet point is this final category of finite simple groups, the groups of Lie type. And these themselves um, can be maybe classified into three groups. So in some sense, the first you know, batch of groups of Lie type are the finite field analogs of the classical matrix groups. So if you think about the classical matrix groups, things like you know, basically all the k by k matrices are the ones with determinant 1. That's the special linear group. That's a, a classical group, usually over the complex numbers. Or you have the unitary matrices, the orthogonal matrices, the symplectic matrices. These are all like nice classical groups. And they all have finite field analogs. So um, you, know, you have to think a little bit of what does it mean, the unitary group over a finite field. But it means something. And these are some of the finite uh, simple groups. These groups are also uh, so-called Chevalier groups. And there are even more Chevalier groups, um, which are finite field analogs of the more exceptional kinds of these classical groups. And you know, there's uh, like five of them. And you know, you can get high dimensional expanders out of them too by our construction, but like not of all dimensions. So you know, if you use E6, you'll get like a six-dimensional expander. But these ones you can get any dimensional expanders. And finally, there's the twisted Chevalier groups, which are like still like the Chevalier groups with an extra twist on them. And um, honestly, I didn't bother to uh, learn their definitions yet. So the Kaufman-Oppenheim uh, paper is really about building high dimensional expanders with symmetries based on this uh, group SLK over a finite field. And what do we do in our work? We kind of generalize this to most of the Chevalier groups. So actually, we tried to do all of the Chevalier groups, but we got stuck on this pesky G2, so we couldn't handle it. But other than that, we did it for all of the uh, Chevalier groups. So, you know, I would like to end in principle by telling you a little bit about our construction, but it's a little bit um, involved, the definitions, because it involves these Chevalier groups. So then it might be natural to tell you just about Kaufman-Oppenheim instruction, which is actually construction, which is actually not that involved. 
But instead, what I thought I would do is tell you the Kaufman-Oppenheim idea, but to try to carry it out with abelian groups. And it's not going to work. You can try to carry it out with abelian groups, and you know you just won't get high-dimensional or even two-dimensional expanders. But I like to show you how you would try anyway, because I think it gives you like the most simple idea of the picture of the Kaufman-Oppenheim construction and our generalization to Chevalier groups. So here's the idea. Um, to make your two-dimensional expanders based on uh, groups. So you start with a big group. And so in this example, I would like this big group G to be the integers mod 105, which is like a nice abelian group under addition. 105 happens to be 3 times 5 times 7. So here's sort of like a funny depiction of this group, 105 um, elements. Uh, so that's one ingredient. The other ingredient is three small, in fact, constant size subgroups of your big group G, which hopefully has many, many elements. So let's call them A, B, and C. And in my example here, the three small constant size subgroups will be A, the multiples of 35, which has size uh, 3, B, the multiples of 21, and C, the multiples of 15. Okay. Now, we've got to make a graph from this. We're trying to construct um, you know, two-dimensional expanders here. So it's going to be a tripartite graph. And uh, the tripartite graph will have three vertex sets. And the vertex set number one will be the elements of G mod A. And number two will be G mod B. And number three will be G mod C. So let's take a peek at this. So what is G mod A? Um, well, it's this set of vertices. This will be one of the three parts of the tripartite graph. This uh, set of 35 vertices. And you see you took the numbers 0 through 104 and you reduced them like mod 35. So, you know, they kind of go into buckets. This vertex sort of stands for 0, 35, and 70. This vertex stands for the numbers that are 1 mod 35, the numbers that are 2 mod 35, and so forth. I should mention that like I drew these in a circle and I kind of put this like dashed line behind them to just kind of make it look like a circle. But actually, these vertices, these 35 vertices are just one of the parts of our tripartite graph and it's tripartite. So actually there are no edges between it in the construction, these vertices. But I nevertheless drew like a dashed circle here to just kind of orient you. Um, okay, as I said, the other two batches of vertices are G mod B. So these are, um, you know, this uh, vertex here stands for all the numbers that are congruent to 2 mod uh, 21, because B was the multiples of 21. And G mod C here, C was the multiples of 15. So, okay, so here are three batches of vertices. Again, these dashed circles are not actually in there. They're just for illustration. And now we have to put in the edges. So when do you put an edge? Well, you just put an edge between two blobs if they have like a number in common, like an element, a uh, representative in common. So for example, one vertex in this graph we're trying to build is has this, sorry, one edge uh, is this one because these two blobs have um, 86 in common. Put an edge here. And this is also an edge because these two little blobs have 16 in common. And this is an edge because these two blobs have 44 in common. And that's it, you just put in all those edges. Uh, okay, and this construction is actually called uh, a coset complex. It's a way to make uh, like a two-dimensional complex, so like a graph with triangles, um, based on the group G and the subgroups A, B, and C. You can do this construction for any group G and subgroups A, B, and C. And this construction even dates back to the PhD thesis of uh, Lenaire in 1950. Okay, so schematically, you know, the coset complex graph that you build kind of looks like this. Here are three batches of vertices, and there's like a bunch of edges between them. And here are some easy facts to prove about coset complex um, graphs. First of all, uh, there's a nice condition for when the graph is connected. It's connected if and only if uh, the subgroups A, B, and C generate G. That's good. Uh, that is, if every vertex in G can be made by um, combining together elements of A, B, and C. Moreover, what's really cool is uh, for every vertex V in, let's say, the G mod A part, you can sort of exactly say what its link. So remember, if you remember all the way back to links, you know, you take a vertex here and imagine lifting it up into the sky. Well, it's already kind of up high on this picture. And you look at everything it's connected to down here, and you look at the edges between them, and that's the link. And that's going to be a bipartite graph, by the way. And uh, the nice thing about this nice construction is that uh, you can exactly say what it's, uh, it looks like. It looks like the coset complex 
with ambient group A and subgroups A intersect B and A intersect C. So that's kind of um, nice. And these are the, you know, cosa complexes you want to be good expanders if you want to build like a two-dimensional expander. So one thing is like, it better be connected if it's gonna be a good expander. And so in particular, um, oops, sorry. In particular, by this first bullet point, you need, among other things, that A should be generated by A intersect B and also by A intersect C. And this is one thing that goes terribly wrong in our abelian example. You can check that this simply does not hold. In fact, if you think about what are A intersect B and A intersect C, I can go back to this slide here. You know, A was the multiples of 35, B was the multiples of 21, so what do they have in common? Actually, just zero. <laughs> So uh, A intersect B is, is zero and A intersect C is just zero. So they fail to generate A. And indeed in our abelian example, like this will not even, uh, the vertex, vertex links will not even be connected. But you know, you might hope that if you go to some kind of interesting non-abelian group, you could find like maybe really big graphs G and three subgroups A, B, and C, which generate G, which moreover have that like, a intersect B and A intersect C generate A, and similarly for B and C. And finally, you also need that, not, you know, not only are these links um, connected, but they're good expanders. So uh, I'm actually wrapping up here. This is the last thing I want to tell you. Um, I'll just tell you what happens in our work. So in my work with Kevin Pratt, um, for every Chevalli group G, uh, even of dimension K, except for the pesky G2, which we couldn't quite handle. We'll, we'll get it at some point. Um, we identified, oops, oh gosh. We identified uh, some order one size subgroups, A1, A2, AK, and so forth, uh, such that G is generated by A1, A2, AK, and so forth. That's good. And also the bipart linked graph, bipartite linked graphs with ambient group AJ and AJ intersect AK are good expanders. Um, having lambda two smaller than a half. So that's all I want to tell you. If you want to see more, uh, you can check out the paper and that's it. You can already tell there's a thank you slide that I accidentally advanced to at the end, but I'll thank you again.